Hello and welcome once again to the Preaching Patriot. Uh, today we have a message that's been promised here uh, for a little bit and I've actually been uh, waiting a little bit to deliver this message uh, to see some of the things that have been unfolding here in our nation in the United States of America. And um, as I mentioned before, we're going to move in this channel more towards delivering the gospel of Christ and more towards delivering prophetic messages as they apply to the events that are happening now. And by that, I don't mean I'm getting any special revelations from God. I'm not a prophet, uh, nor the son of a prophet. Uh, nor have any special gifts of any kind that, uh, that uh, give me any kind of uh, charismatic application and so forth, that I might know those kind of things. Uh, basically, what I'm doing is I'm applying the gifts that God has given me, which are the gifts of teaching and the gift of prophecy, which is to share his word, proclaim his word with you, being able to discern very cleanly what his word says in terms of what is happening now. Uh, those things are the scriptural applications of those particular biblical gifts. <clears throat> now, when I say that we're going to be shifting in that direction, as I mentioned in my last message, one of the things I, I would like you to continue to be aware of is that we will be continuing with the COVID series. We are going to complete that. Uh, we have a lot more detail to cover in that. And if there are additional things you want to see after that is completed, uh, we'll certainly take the time to address that as well. So that doesn't mean we're moving completely away from that type of venue, but we want to focus more because scripturally and biblically, we see that we are truly in the end times and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is imminent. And it's our responsibility as preachers, teachers, evangelists, missionaries, servants of Christ on all levels, and there's not higher and lower levels, there's just different gifts, different administrations, and different responsibilities. But each and every one of us who are brothers and sisters in Christ have the responsibility to share Christ and to share what we know and to give an account for why we have joy in Christ, why we have that peace that passes all understanding in this time of apparent turmoil. And along those lines, I also would like to share with you that in the message segment, in the, in the comment segment below, where we actually I shouldn't say the comment segment, in the description box uh, below this video, there is going to be a plethora of links to various topics. I'm not going to discuss those topics in this video. However, in a near future video, I'm going to give you my take on some of the key things that have been happening here in the United States. The video may run 20 or 30 minutes, uh, give or take, and just some important things to think about. My take, my view, I'm not imposing my views upon you, but I'm telling you from my standpoint as someone who reasonably understands scripture, studies scripture very regularly, spends a lot of time talking to the Lord, uh, talking to the Father through uh, the Lord in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit as, uh, as the Lord uh, directs us in his word and uh, following the Word of God and following day-to-day -day activities uh, according to the Word of God, these are the things that I see. 
I would challenge you to be a Berean and go search the scriptures for yourself and see if the things that I'm telling you are so. If I hit a point hard, go ahead, challenge it, because that's your responsibility as a follower of Christ, if indeed you are a follower of Christ. Today's message is entitled, Where We Are and Why. It's an entirely biblical message. And while I may point out a few little nuances of things that are taking place in our country, around the world, the bottom line is we're going to look at this from the broad spectrum of the Bible, where we are and why. Before we get started, I'd like to invite you, if you haven't already, to subscribe to our channel so that you can stay updated on new posts. Um, feel free to comment, uh, like if you like the content that's here, and feel free to share this with folks as you see fit. So let's take a moment and go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless our time. Heavenly Father, we come before you this day giving you thanks and praise for all things. One of the wonderful blessings that we have is that we can cast our cares upon you because you care for us. That very promise is in your word. So when we see turmoil taking place all around us, we can rest assured that as the Lord Jesus has told us that when we are given peace, it is not the same peace as the world thinks of, which is the absence of conflict. There's always conflict in the world. There's always, there are always issues in the world which cause turmoil, which cause disarray. It is our place to trust in you, to trust you with all our heart and not lean to our own understanding. It is our place not to be blown about with every wind of change, with every doctrine of man. It is our place to rest in you, to trust in you, and to believe in you for all things, and thereby live in that peace that passes all understanding, instead of being unstable in all of our ways. And we pray as we look into your word today, Father, that you would open our eyes, you would open our minds, you would open our hearts, and show us clearly the truth in your word that we might truly know that we can rest in you. And we thank you now for these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. To begin with, I'm going to lay down a very flat thesis. Because with all of the things happening here in the United States of America, there's been a lot of disappointment in the conservative arena. There's been a lot of disappointment in the evangelical Christian arena arena. And, and why do we say evangelical Christian? You hear that a lot among Christians. A lot of Christians will say evangelical Christian. Why? Because we are the Christians that reach out and share Christ. Jesus didn't differentiate between Christians back during his time. In fact, Paul commanded the church at, at Corinth in 1 Corinthians not to differentiate between sects or groups or divisions or denominations. He said, we're, we're all of one body. We're all of one Christ. We're all of one spirit. But the reason we do that is because we are identifying Christians that are following the great commandment, the great commission. Jesus told us not once, but twice, actually three times, we are to reach the world. He told us at the end of Matthew, he told us at the end of Mark, and he told us at the beginning of Acts, we're to reach the world. We've got to reach out, whether it's our next door neighbor, whether it's members of our family, whether it's our community, wherever it is, wherever, our, wherever we find ourselves, wherever we feel ourselves called or led, that's our responsibility. We need to reach out. And there's no more precious time and no more exciting time, I have to tell you, than this. When I make these videos, I'm just ecstatic because I can reach the world 
and not me, but many like me, thousands and thousands like me, can reach the world for Christ and say, hey, you think things are, are, are a mess where you live? You think your, your government's messed up? You think your leaders are messed up? You think your, your uh, leader selection system is messed up? You think your, your legislation is messed up? You, you, you think you, you know, whatever process is messed up? Look in God's word. He's in control. And, and if you think he's not, just look at the plan he's laid out. Look at, look at the prophecy that he's talked about for the behavior of mankind. While you might not like what you see, you're going to find out it falls right in line with what God said in his word was going to happen. It's what we call the bittersweet truth of prophecy. The sweet truth of prophecy is that God's always right. The bitter part is that often there's a lot of suffering here on earth as a result of it. It's not God's hand doing it. God doesn't want us to suffer. It's man imposing his own will in place of God's that's causing it to happen. The thing, the very thing that got Adam and Eve kicked out of the garden to begin with continues to happen today. So I'm going to make a statement here. This is my thesis statement which means my foundational statement for the entire message. It's, it's virtually a sermon today. That, 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 this is, that this is all about today, that this message is all about. So hang on to your seats, put your seatbelt on, take a cold drink of iced tea or, or water, or whatever you got there. Sit back, hang on for a minute. So I'm going to tell you something that some Christians are, are not going to like. And some Americans are not going to like because they've been hanging on to something for the last four years that they need to learn to let go of and focus somewhere else. The U.S. is not God's chosen nation. Ouch. Folks, you go into Scripture, you're not even going to find the United States of America mentioned anywhere. Oh, I've heard people talk about eagles and everything else, and that has to refer to the United States and all this kind of stuff. And these are the same kind of people that said that Ronald Wilson Reagan was the Antichrist because his name had six letters beginning, middle, and end. Okay, so there's no logic behind that, but it sure sounds good. You can get a crowd riled up with it. It's not, folks. The United States is not God's chosen nation. It's a great nation because it founded, it was founded on the principles of God. It was founded on the laws and the edicts found in Scripture. And, and even history now is trying to take us away from that and take us into Grecian society and take us into Roman society and take us into all of these other societies and, and trying to give Plato credit and trying to give all of these other people credit for what Jesus Christ gave us and blessed us with and what God the Father blessed us with. I'm seeing a lot of that today and I'm seeing it from some conservative strong conservative candidates for future election positions. Just watch that. No, folks, the U.S. is not God's chosen nation. Israel is. The little nation over there in Western Asia, about the size of New Jersey, give or take, that's God's chosen nation. And when we get saved as Gentiles, we are grafted into the promise given to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, specifically in 12, 3. And then there are other promises that follow, but that's where it began. I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curseth thee. And in thee shall all of the nations of the earth be blessed. That's important. Not in the United States. 
not in the president of the United States, not in the best conservative leadership that we could possibly have, not in them will you be blessed. Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, and, and anyone else you want to mention uh, in, in, spe in specific or, or in particular, um, uh, Abraham Lincoln and others. No. Abraham, the founder who, who never even himself had a hand in taking possession of the promised land. And yet he was promised for his generations to come. Israel is the one that received God's promise. Israel is the one that received God's blessing so that they could carry the torch. They could shine the light. And those who wanted to follow God followed Israel, joined with Israel, and were grafted in. Hey, guess what? Even back in the Old Testament, they were grafted in and accepted as one born among the tribes of Israel. Amen. This is the truth. Deuteronomy 14, 2. I'd like you to read or listen to this or read this real quickly. You're going to hear some pages rustling and turning because I'm reading directly out of the Bible today. I did not pre-print anything here except for the references. I'm going to be turning today. Deuteronomy 14, 2 reads, And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron and against the congregation unto them, saying, Would to God we had died in the land of Egypt. Would to God we had died in the wilderness. Who were they crying to? They were crying to God. Why were they crying to God? Well, because they, they thought they thought they had something better in a place where they were instead of having a better future promise. And, and we see a lot of folks today in what has, be, what has become the greatest nation on earth, they start turning things inward and they start getting selfish. And they say, I want to satisfy all of these needs. I want to have all of my needs satisfied now. I want to have this need satisfied. I want to have that need satisfied. I want to have all of these things satisfied. And God kept giving them and satisfying them and satisfying them and satisfying them. And finally, they went too far. And they made that golden calf. God said, you know what? Mm -mm. That's, that's the end of it. I have given you rules, I have given you laws, I have given you directives, and you know what? I've given you everything you've wanted, and I've just asked you to follow these things as a shining beacon to the rest of the world that I am your God and you are my people, and I love you and you love me. And, and you wouldn't do that. And so you know what? You're going to wander for 40 years, and your next generation will take the land. <clears throat> it brings up one more point. When they first came, they could, have, they could have been in Canaan in a very short period of time. They could have been in Canaan pretty quickly. What happened? When they got to Canaan, there were members of each tribe that were sent but only two said that they would be able to go back and fight for the land as God had called them to do. That was Joshua and Caleb. The rest of the people said, no, there's giants in the land. There's big people in the land. We can't fight those giants. No way. Uh -uh. We can't do that. They were thinking about their physical strength, their physical prowess, and not thinking about the God who had delivered them out of Egypt. We've forgotten our God, friends. We've forgotten him. We've forgotten what he can do. We've forgotten the mighty things he has done to bring our nation where it is now. We've completely abandoned him to do things on our own strength and to satisfy our own lust to the point where we virtually worship leaders, even good leaders, because they can give us what we want now. 
whether we want to satisfy our own lusts and just do our own thing to the most base and, and, and terrible lustful things, hurtful, harmful things, whether to ourselves or someone else, or whether they are actually good things, constitutional things, foundational things, solid things, but we're looking to our leaders for salvation. We're looking to our leaders for salvation. And remember, God said, no, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee, talking to Abraham, and in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. No, I'm blessing this nation. And later on, he would continue to promise that out of this nation, out of the root of Jesse, out of one of the tribes, the tribe of Judah, would come the Savior. He's the Savior, Jesus Christ. Not a president, not a senator, not a congressman, not a governor or a mayor, not a leader of any kind. Now, it's great if they follow Christ. It's great if they do what they're supposed to. If they say they're a Christian and then they behave like a Christian, that's wonderful. But they are not a savior. And sometimes God removes them by means that seem totally unfair, totally out of the realm of reason. But he knows what he's doing. Because God's not about fairness. God's about righteousness. I remember having this discussion with someone years ago. Someone said, well, if God does this, it's not fair. I said, but can God do anything that's wrong? Can God do anything that's wrong? Is it in his nature to, do any, to, to make any error? And the person said, no. I said, well, then I want you to think what you said. Think about what you said. If your sense of fairness does not agree with God's sense of righteousness, then who's wrong? God's righteousness is always correct, even if you don't think it's fair. I like to take people to the, uh, to the parable of the workers in the field. Some workers worked all day, an 11, 12 hour day. They got paid a full day's wage. Some workers worked one hour. They got paid a full day's wage. Why? Because everyone contracted for the same amount of money. Well, some people will run out and say, that's not fair. That's not fair. First of all, the money belonged to the man who hired the people, hired the workers. It's his money to do with what he wants to. He chooses what's right and what's not. He makes the rules that are righteous. It's not up to us. When people try to force individuals to do certain things with their money, it's good to be charitable. We should all be charitable. But to force someone to be charitable to a certain degree is wrong. A person has their money, has their wealth, whether great or small, and they have the right to do with what they've earned, whatever they choose, whether it's something evil or something good. And then they, of course, will, they of course will realize the consequence of whatever they choose. <clears throat> Here's another thing we want to think about before we close out this idea and move to the next point. The U.S., just like every other nation in the world, will come and go. The U.S. will be here. The U.S. will be gone. Israel remains forever. Israel has been promised to be here forever. We know Israel is going to be here at the end of the tribulation, we know that Israel, in another form, is going to be here in the new heaven and the new earth because there's going to be a new Jerusalem. So we know Israel is an eternal nation, whereas the United States is not. So if we're putting all of our eggs in one basket and saying, well, I will, I will sacrifice everything and, and put all I have into the United States to the exclusion of all else, including Christianity, including Christ, we need to rethink that. Sure, we should be good men, good women, 
we should be willing to sacrifice for our fellow man, fellow woman, our mankind. We should be willing to serve. And we should be willing to do whatever it is that we should do when we're called upon to do it and do it as a servant of Christ, whatever that may be, to the best of our ability. But our heart should always be bent towards the Lord. That makes a big difference because we need to realize that we should not be focusing on any human being as our Savior. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6 tells us, no man comes unto the Father but by him. There's no other way. So no matter how many good deeds you do, no matter how great you are in this world, no matter how much you do for your country and how great your country is, you're not going to be able to put a toenail in heaven without Christ because it's his righteousness that covers the very sin nature that exists in you. That's what the Bible says. Don't talk to me about whether it's fair or not. It's God's way, and it's righteous, and it's right, because he said so. Those are the rules. You can play by the rules or get kicked out of the game. That's the way it works. Now, the next thing is God has appointed a time in which all may come to him through Christ. And this is important because we're seeing a, we're just seeing a whole big mess of stuff. Um, I use some scientific terminology there, a mess of stuff going on in the world right now. And here in the United States, it's like a whirlwind and a blender. It's just, everything's just happening right now. All right, I'm recording this message. It's towards the tail end of, of March of 2021. And there's us all kinds of craziness happening right now. Some things good, some things not so good. Nothing's neutral. There's nothing neutral in this country right now. Everything's just going on. And God has appointed a time, we call it the age of grace. And this time that he has appointed for us to be saved is now. It's going to happen differently during the Great Tribulation, and it's going to be much harder. And the consequences are going to be much more severe. Now, right now, in some countries... Salvation brings a death sentence. There are some countries in the, in, the, in the world right now where if you get saved, you can be shunned from your family, you can be shunned from your community, you can be at a point where you can't buy in a marketplace, you can be in a, at a place where you can't live in a home, you're pretty much ostracized from your community, but there are other places where the government comes after you and they put you to death. Literally, literally put you to death right now. It'll be like that all over the world during the Great Tribulation. So it'll be much, much harder. You will have to sacrifice everything. At one point, the founders of our nation sacrificed their lives, their honor, and their sacred fortune for the founding of our nation. That's what they wrote on the Declaration of Independence. That's how they signed it. That's what it'll be like during the Great Tribulation for everyone on Earth. Right now, the vast majority of people on Earth and everyone in the United States can still accept Christ freely. Maybe a little ribbing from your friends who don't understand and don't know Christ, but at least you're still free to do it. Friends, I don't know how much longer that's going to last because we are very aggressively being attacked in the workplace. We're very aggressively being attacked in the public square. We're very aggressively being attacked in government. Now, there are states that are going in the other direction. There is a large division right now taking place in our nation. There are, it's almost a 50-50 split right now. It's, it's, it's tipping. Uh, it's almost a 50-50 split. Not that long ago, the, the split was like 80-20, 70-30. Now it's, now it's shifting the other way but there's still a significant division. If we go to 2 Corinthians in the New Testament, and we go to chapter 6, and we go to verse 2. Actually, I'm going to back up a little bit more. 
We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye may receive not the grace of God in vain. It means don't receive it empty. And the grace of God, we use a little acronym, God's riches at Christ's expense. We get what we don't deserve while Christ took the punishment he did not deserve. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation I have succored or comforted thee. Behold, now is the accepted time, now is the day of salvation. Verse 3 goes on to say, giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. We sometimes are put between a rock and a hard place. But Jesus himself did no less. And right now in our country, we are being tested and, and tried. Not tempted, but tried and tested. Because we are being put in a situation where a lot of people are afraid. And their first reaction is not to run to the truth. Their first reaction is, get me out of it. Get me out of it. I've been living in comfort for so long. I've been living in luxury for so long. Even if they've been lower income, uh, in a lower income situation and not really living, you know, what we might think as luxurious, you know, in a lot of wealth, still, all of a sudden, all of these things are put on them. All of these mandates, uh, which I'll talk about in another video, ha have been put on them, all of these restrictions, and it's becoming very, very difficult for them to function in a lot of different ways. Separation from family, separation from co-workers, uh, hindrances in just everyday life. So many, so many things that not only are they just inconveniences, but now they're becoming very burdensome. And some states have, some states have changed that and they've lifted a lot of that and they've gotten rid of it. Other states are doubling down and making it even more challenging. Folks, I have moments where I feel like, man, I just wish I could go somewhere and exhale and let it all out. But you know what? The Lord tells us to stand the course. He, said, he, he, tells, us, he, he tells us to remain firm. He tells us to stand fast in the faith. Right? Doesn't be instant in season and out of season. Doesn't matter whether it's popular or not. You follow the Lord. You stay faithful to him and everything will be fine. And we have to continue the message. It's sometimes, I have a five-year-old and I love him dearly. But five-year-olds can have a switch that goes on and off. One moment they are the most loving, most caring, most obedient, most generous uh, little critters that you could ever think of. Okay? And the next minute, oh my goodness, it's, it's, it's like you have given instructions to a brick wall. And, and, and you tell them a hundred times, and you realize as a parent, I'm probably going to have to tell them a thousand more. Because it's just the way it is. And, it, and it's a part of the age that they go through. It just, it's, it's life. You can get frustrated, but you're only just going to worry yourself. You're going you're gonna to have a frustration on yourself. So you're just going to have to tell them some more. And the reason I say that is because in chapter 3 of Matthew, the John the Baptist began his ministry with one word, repent. Jesus, after being tempted in the wilderness of Satan and was refreshed, began his earthly ministry with that same word, repent. And it wasn't just repent. It was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Folks, that word applies every bit as much today as it did 2,000 years ago. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Our nation needs repentance. Collectively, to restore the nation to its former glory, because the only glory you're ever going to have is glory in Christ. Otherwise, it's fading glory, and it's going to crumble. I hand as an example the Roman Empire, the Grecian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Assyrian Empire, the Syrian Empire. I'll stop. You get the picture. 
you don't know about those, look them up. They all crushed and fell, mostly from within. Sin and debauchery caused them to fall from within. Now, the Roman Empire in another form will rise again, but not like it was before. Not at all. Not even close. Repentance is the key. It is a change of mind that brings about a change of heart, that brings about a change of will. What we do is we give ourselves to Christ and let him begin to work. Metano et o. Okay. It also, another word that's used is epistrefo. Metano et o means to a change of mind, a change of purpose, a change of, a, a, a change of thought. Okay. The other word, epistrefo, meaning to turn around and go the other way, okay, to walk around. These words are very important because what these words tell us is that we're no longer walking with the crowd. Okay, it's kind of like going down, it's kind of like going down a force three or a force four river, uh, and, and the number represents roughly ten knots. It's kind of like going down that river, and then all of a sudden you say, wait a minute, I'm going to wade upstream. Uh, it's not so easy, but that's the right way to go. And that's the way you have to go. And when you walk with Jesus, that's the way you're going to be walking the rest of your life. And guess what? Sometimes that water is going to push you over to the, to the edge of the shore. It's going to push you over to the riverbank, and you're going to have to hang on for dear life for a little bit until you get some help, maybe from another believer, or until the Lord Jesus comes along and tugs you back out again. You call, you cry out to him for help, and he'll tug you back out and get going again. You just keep going. You get beat up a lot. You really do. It's not a cakewalk by any stretch of the imagination. But that's the truth. The Apostle uh, Peter further tells us in Acts that there's none other name under heaven um, whereby we, uh, we must be saved. Um, John, again, John 14, 6, I quoted it earlier, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He says so himself. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, Jesus says. In the red letter edition, those words will all be in red. This age of grace began at Pentecost, uh, beginning of Acts chapter 2, 50 days after um, after the week uh, or the weekend in which Jesus was uh, crucified and resurrected uh, Pentecost then was a celebration in many different ways one way here was the Holy Spirit actually fell the account is that the Holy Spirit sat or lit upon each of those in the upper chamber the upper room there were 120, as cloven tongues like as of fire. Okay, what does that mean? I'm going to be honest with you, I don't know. I wasn't there. But it had to be something pretty glorious to behold. Uh, I've heard some preachers say, well, it's kind of like a little flame that sat on their head. Maybe it sat on their shoulder. Maybe it kind of engulfed their body. We're not quite sure. We know the Holy Spirit came down uh, appearing in, in the form of a dove or in, appearing in a form like a dove uh, when Jesus was baptized of John the Baptist. Um, so we don't know exactly what this means, but it certainly was a glorious event. And they began speaking in tongues. And it's unfortunate that this word was never translated in newer translations um, the way it the way other words have been retranslated into modern language, but it was just hung on to. Because literally what it means is languages. It literally means languages, right? Because there are 16 or 17 languages mentioned. Nowhere does it say in Scripture that those tongues are ethereal languages, spiritual languages, angelic languages, languages that are unknown to mankind. They are all spoken, known spoken languages. Uh, and every one of those languages there that happened that day in Jerusalem were, in fact, identified because God wants his word to be 
known. He wants his word to be known. And he doesn't want you speaking in Russian if there's no Russian present. He doesn't want you preaching the gospel in Russian if there's no Russian present, either to interpret or to hear. He doesn't want you preaching it in Swahili if there's nobody speaking Swahili present, either to interpret or to hear. Because it's just like, as Paul says, you're a sounding board or a tinkling cymbal. All right, you're just making noise. Right? Speak the language the people understand. That's all there is to it. The concept of tongues is really that simple. If it had been translated languages, we would never have that. We would never have that issue. This age of grace, I mentioned this a little earlier. I want to make a little stronger emphasis of this. This age of grace ends when the body of Christ is corporately taken out. The dead in Christ shall rise first. In fact, I'm going to go to 1 Thessalonians 4 because this is a very important passage. And 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. Thessalonica was a church that faced a lot of persecution at this time. It was facing a lot of persecution. Paul wrote two letters to the church at Thessalonica. The first letter found them in this heavily persecuted situation. The second letter found them after they had been comforted and gave them further assurance of the Christ to return, and the things that were to come. As we're looking at this heavily persecuted church, feeling very down, very depressed, a lot of struggling going on, kind of like what we're facing right now. Knowing that the last events that have to take place before the Lord's return to take his church up bodily, the dead in Christ rising first and then we which remain uh, shall meet the Lord in the air, and, and uh, so ever shall be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We're going to read that in just a moment. This is a comforting thought. And even if someone does not receive this comforting thought initially, at least they've heard it. And once it enters the ear, it can't go back out. It enters the ear, it gets into the brain, people start thinking. Start thinking, wait a minute. What if there is an escape? What if there is a way out? What if there is an eternity to be gained and a hell to be shunned? And what if I'm seeing a glimpse of this hell right now on this earth, and this is just the teeniest tip of the iceberg, and what if this thing does blow up one day and I don't have a way out? Wow. Am I really being blessed by now, by the hand of God telling me there's an eternity and I need to be part of it? Folks, never underestimate sharing the Word of God, no matter how little you are able to get out. Let's read 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Oh, friends, there are so many ignorant folks today, and I don't say that in a negative way. I don't say that in a condescending way. I simply mean people that just don't know the truth. I mean it in its most simple and most basic form. They just don't know the truth. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That is God's cry through his prophets, through his apostles, through his followers. And that's where we are right now. I watch things go through go through media. I watch things go through legislators, come out of legislators' mouths. I watch people in the streets sometimes. They say things that just make absolutely no sense. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I would not have you to be ignorant, my friends. Listen, the truth is so simple. A child could understand it. Just listen. Put all the noise aside and listen to the truth. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, 
It means those that have died. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. See, there are some that have no hope because they've died in vain. They died without Christ. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which are asleep, those that have died in Christ, in Jesus, will God bring with him. God abandons no one. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. In other words, they're coming with us. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And this trump or trumpet has nothing to do with the seven trumpets given in the trumpet judgments in Revelation. They are entirely different events. Entirely different. I actually did a sheet, did a study, and put it out on Facebook back when I was out there, given, giving the complete division on why these things are, com comparison, showing why these things are entirely different events. They, 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 they can't even be within the same timeline, within the same time frame at all. With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then, which we, then we which are alive and remaineth shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That's a comforting thought. Before things get completely out of hand, before the bombs drop, before the missiles hit, before the earthquakes crash, and I'm just using all these as euphemisms. I don't know exactly what all is going to happen first. In fact, my understanding is there might be a little bit of a lull of activity. There might be a little bit of turmoil. There might be some serious turmoil right at the the rapture, and then a little bit of a lull before it all gets ugly again. The smoke clears. But whatever, right before it really gets nasty, we're, we're out of here. You know, right before the ship capsizes, we're pulled up in a bunch of helicopters. You know, just euphemism, just comparisons, just pictures, images. But the bottom line is it's rescue. Rusatai is the Greek word. Pulled out. You know, just, just taken out of there. You'll get some arguments sometimes. Well, this uh, this word rapture, it's not in the Bible. And uh, you're right. In English, it's not in the Bible. And in the Greek, it's not in the Bible. Uh, it comes from rapturo. Uh, it's a Latin word. And in uh, Latin translations, that's the word that's used. So that's where we get it from. Um, so it's another one of those words that has been translated into uh, another language just as valid to be to be caught away uh, as it is in in English so as we move ahead to our last section and yes this is a long message um, back when I used to preach pretty regularly uh, I was told that uh, I did not preach a sermonette but you know what? When the Lord has a message, he, he wants it delivered. And uh, I try to be respectful of people's time, but uh, I also know that when God has something to share, he, he wants it told. So I don't apologize for spending extra time sharing his word. Now this last part, though no man knows the day or the hour, and we're told that in Acts 1, 6 through 7, the Lord Jesus himself tells us that. We're told that no man knows the day or the hour of the Lord, Lord's return. He has given us signposts to watch for. And I, that's my word, signposts, but I like that. It's like getting ready to come up to an exit. You've been driving for hours, maybe even days, and you're looking for a specific place that you're ready to get to. Let's say you're driving cross country and you're trying to get to the Grand Canyon. You're going to start looking for signs that say Grand Canyon National Park because you want to get there. Uh, so hopefully you're going to be seeing some of those signs, you know, a little ways out so that you know you're getting closer and you're getting closer and you're on the right route. 
Uh, today with GPS, it's a lot easier, but I remember driving back in the 70s and 80s when you didn't have that. And uh, even I remember being a passenger in the car in the 60s and uh, my dad's driving and you didn't have that. You had a fold out Atlas map. And or Rand McNally map, and you you had to you know look for the signs, and if you missed them, you'd turn around and go back, and sometimes that turnaround could take a long time. So you look for the signposts, and that's what we're doing. And, and God gives it to us. Jesus gives us many signposts, and the promise of the Holy Spirit is also given during that time too in Acts chapter one. Uh, verses 4 through 5, and then, of course, chapter 8, where we are all called, the, the apostles present are called, and we by proxy, because we are disciples as well, we are all disciples if we're followers of Christ, are called to be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Are we supposed to go to Jerusalem to start witnessing? No, but we are to parallel our witnessing. We are to witness first, in our homes, in our, in our closest circle, most inner circle, then Judea, broaden it out, neighborhood, Samaria, town, state, whatever that happens to be for you, then the uttermost parts of the earth, your largest circle of influence, and then broaden your circle of influence. Well, this is, folks, you are my uttermost parts of the earth. And I've been witnessing for some 20 almost, well, almost, wow, 29 years now. So uh, thank you, Lord Jesus. I've been having an opportunity to do that and seeing uh, a number of souls come to Christ during that time and what a blessing it has been. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It's, it, every time you see a soul come to Christ, every time you hear of a soul that, you, that you've preached to or taught to or talked to or had a one-on-one -on -one with, and especially if you are present when it takes place. Oh my goodness. If you're present when it takes place, <laughs> I can't even tell you what it's like. Every time, every time, you can feel the angels in heaven rejoicing because it just rocks your soul. That's all I can say. It. That's all I can say to you. It just does. Oh man, that's all I can say. It's just, it's just incredible. It's just beautiful. But... When we look at, um, at signs that are given, Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 12, I'm going to go there for a minute. The Lord Jesus gives us some early signs. Now, I have a whole commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, and I picked Matthew. I haven't done a commentary on any of the other Gospels yet. I would like to do more in the future. In fact, I'm beginning to do a commentary on the book of Acts. I'm going to be starting that here in the next uh, week or two. That's going to be on my Bible Doctor channel here on YouTube. Uh, I'll also be copying it over onto Rumble as well and be putting that on, um, uh, on um, my podcast for Spotify. So it'll be out there as well. And uh, if, if you look up the commentary for Matthew and you go to the commentaries, because I have multiple, I have, I have several commentaries for Matthew chapter 24 because it took several, uh, several takes to get through the whole chapter, I go into a lot of detail about how that whole chapter actually covers multiple prophetic time periods. It's not just, it's not an answer to one question. It's an answer to three, there we go, three questions. It's not just an answer to one question, but we're just going to look at a tiny part of it here for just a moment that applies to the pre-tribulation period. Matthew chapter 24 verses 4 through 12, you're going to see some early natural signs and a few human behavioral Signs. I'm just going to read this briefly. Jesus answers the questions about when will these things be and what will be the sign, what will be these signs of your return. And he says, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So there are those that will pretend to be Christ or say that they're Christ. And we've seen quite a bit of that. I mean, we've David Koresh comes to mind from a number of years back in the Branch Davidians, but there's been a lot. There's been a lot. That was one of the one, big ones in the news, but there's been a lot. 
Um, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, okay, both wars and rumors of wars. And by the way, as we see these things, we see them increasing. They don't necessarily need to increase in size, but a lot of times they increase in volume, many, many, many of these things. And things don't just don't seem to go away. They just seem to linger for no particular reason. You know, it should be done, over with, yet it keeps going on and on and on and on and just can't seem to shake it. And that's where we are right now. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So, folks, it's unsettling, and we don't like to see it, and we hate to see people suffer. We hate to see people get killed. We hate to see nations in turmoil, but guess what? God said it's got to happen. If God says it's got to happen, it's got to happen, and there's nothing you're going to do to change it. Read Acts chapter 5. Read the words of Gamaliel, a very wise Pharisee who did, as far as I can read, as far as I can read into what the Bible is telling us, did get saved. <clears throat> a former teacher of Saul, who became the last apostle, Apostle Paul. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there is a difference between nation and kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And yes, we are seeing that. And I'm seeing the earthquakes more and more. They don't make the big news, but they're out there. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Notice he said the beginning of sorrows. So we're probably going to see some of that before the rapture. We're going we're gonna to see the tip of the iceberg. It's kind of like the picture I'm seeing and this is just me conjuring up the image and comparing it to other scriptural things. I'm not having any special prophetic visions or anything like that. Just comparing it scripture to scripture. It's kind of like Moses seeing the promised land. <coughs> Excuse me. Moses sees the promised land, but he doesn't pass over. Okay. Well, that's going to be, I really do see from all of the, prophetic study, end time prophetic study that I have done, the eschatological studying that I have done, I see that that's going to be very much what it's going to be like for the believer at the time of the rapture. We are going to see that wave getting ready to crash on the shore. We are going to see the curses coming. We're going to see the volcano about ready to erupt. However, I'm just, again, I'm just using euphemisms, comparisons, I'm just, just some picture, picture words here. We're going to see that coming, but we're not going to be here when it hits. We're not going to be here when it happens. How close it's going to be, I don't know. I think it's going to be pretty close. I think it's going to be like being snatched out of the mouth of the lion. That thing's going to be that close. Could be wrong, all right? <clears throat> but I think that's how close it's going to be. Okay, brief pause. I uh, had um, a little coughing fit going on there. I went and got a drink and uh, a little cough drop here. I apologize for that. After speaking for almost an hour solid, yes, it's been an hour. Um, sometimes you get a little dry. I'll fix that right up. So, a couple more verses. We saw that these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then the next couple of verses point specifically to the disciples at hand with Jesus at the moment, but they do also refer to disciples during the latter time. And we have seen this over the last couple of decades. We have seen this on the news with our own eyes. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and, shall, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Folks, I have to stop there for a minute. Do you realize what's happening in the United States right now? Do you realize that there are certain things that, while they are not actually law, they are being promoted as good behavior? 
where there is no proof of these things being good behavior, there's no proof of these things being necessary or even advantageous in any way, but they are being promoted as socially, as, as socially acceptable and as highly, highly, highly recommended. And it has gotten to the point where it has dragged out long enough that people are actually verbally and sometimes even physically attacking one another to partake in these so-called suggested behaviors. Okay? My wife and I both have been verbally assaulted. Okay? And I don't call a verbal assault assault. It's just like and people use that terminology and I'm using it because it's, it's common verbiage. Uh, I don't consider being spoken to harshly, being verbally assaulted. I'm, I grew up in Baltimore. I, I'm a little tougher than that. But we have. We've been verbally attacked for not participating in really what is an unnecessary behavior. Uh, certainly is not a behavior that warrants that kind of behavior. But... This is the result of fear. This is a result of conditioned fear. Jesus tells us through his apostle Peter, perfect love casts out fear because fear hath torments. Okay, fear hath torment. People are being tormented in our nation right now. People are being tormented around the world without anybody even touching them. They're being tormented in their minds. They're being tormented in their hearts. They're being tormented in their souls. When you come to know Christ Jesus, that torment goes away because now you have love and compassion for others. I sat down, I was watching a certain behavior, and I'm not going to mention it on this video. You probably know what it is, but I'm not going to mention it on this video. I have another video for that. And I'm watching this behavior, and I'm just looking at it, and, I'm, and I just had to put down my mental notes in in on a, on a uh, on an audio recording for about two and a half minutes or so, maybe just to vent a little bit. I didn't get angry. I was real. I was heartbroken. I was literally heartbroken that people were literally doing this willingly because they're afraid. They're afraid, and they have nothing to fear. And if they knew Christ, it would be a totally different behavior. Totally different behavior. And, and I'm not talking about fear because they're complying with his behavior. I'm talking about fear because of their body language, their action. Yeah, that kind of fear. And it's sad. It's sad. It's heartbreaking. But this is what people will do. If you don't stand for God, you'll fall for anything. And I can't take credit for that one. I have a former pastor who shared that and many other very good anecdotes. <clears throat> Many false prophets shall arrive, shall arise, and deceive many. And because of iniqu and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Perfect love casts out fear. So when that love goes away, fear is everywhere. If you want to see the big picture of what's taking place right now, and I'm, I'm not going to read any of this. I'm going to leave this for you. You can go to Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. I also have a commentary, a complete commentary on the book of Revelation on my Bible Doctor um, <clears throat> channel here on YouTube. And it's a 66-part commentary. You don't have to listen to the whole thing. You could go to Revelation and decide, oh, I want to learn more about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which a lot more is made out of them than really what's there. Um, Hollywood has totally destroyed <laughs> what the truth is there. Uh, but what the real truth is, you can find it if you look up the Chapter 6 videos. There are several of those. But if you look up the chapter 3 and 4 videos, they are broken down by the churches. Okay, there are seven churches of Asia Minor, and it's broken down by the churches. If you look through, those seven churches represent the seven 
represents seven different churches that existed in the first century AD in what is now modern-day Turkey. And by the way, all seven of those cities are still there 2,000 years later, which is pretty neat. And I do believe there's a church in each city still. Okay? It may not be as devout or as Christian as they ought to be, but they are still physically still there. <clears throat> now, if you look at those seven churches, you will also find two things. You will find the seven stages that the church has gone through from the time of the apostles to present day, which is, which is we are now in the last days, the latter time of the end times, the latter days of the age of grace. You will also find a parallel to the seven secular ages, or the seven human ages, which is also very fascinating. It's not that the church paralleled the human ages, it's that the human ages paralleled the church ages. The world, whether it knows it or not, always follows the church. When the church is strong, the world is more sound. Because who made the world? God made the world. So when his church is strong, the world is sound. Now, is all the world sound? Is all the world perfect? Is all the world right? No. But the world is at its best, despite its many, many flaws and many, many sinners and many, many errors, the world is at its best and most secure when the church is at its best. When the church is at its worst, which means it's either doing something really wrong or it's really, really weak and just kind of kind of given up. And by the way, that's where we are now. We are in the age of apathy. It's called the Laodicean age, where the church just says, hey, anything goes. That's good. You can have um, you can have preachers that uh, that you know, and leadership that doesn't follow um, you know doesn't follow uh, godly rules, right? God put God put man in charge of the family. God put man in charge of nations. God put man in charge of this and man in charge of that. Uh, but we'll change those rules. That's okay. In the New Testament, God put man in charge of churches, and if you don't like it, I'm sorry, but that's what that's what First Timothy teaches us, and First Timothy teaches us that by reflecting back to Genesis. And then, if you learn a little bit of Greek, you learn that the noun usage, the noun and pronoun usage, also bears that out. It's not just a situational thing. It's a solid, uh, a solid teaching. But I'm not going to argue that point here. God said, I hate, um, I hate any kind of relationship outside of marriage. Not just, not just a strange relationship, a man with a man, a woman with a woman. He said, I, I hate men with, men with beasts, women with beasts, which means animals. Uh, I hate um, relationships outside of marriage, even if it's a man with a woman, woman with a man. said, I don't like that. I, I, I hate adultery. Uh, I hate that. If you're married, you're supposed to, you're supposed to be married. I hate divorce. Uh, there's only one reason for divorce, and that is adultery. And if somebody marries the adulterer or adulteress, um, guess what? Now they're an adulterer. You know, I hate that sin. I still love the sinner. I still love the sinner. I want them to get things right in their life, but I can't have fellowship with them until they get things straightened out. Right? They got to get things straightened out. Come to me, repent, get things right, start behaving right. Then I can fellowship with them. I can save them and they can be mine, but they can't walk together with me. So we got a problem. People just do whatever they want. And we're told by Jesus that when he returns, it'll be... Just like it was in Noah's day, people would be eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day the flood came. Until the day that flood came. That's what it's going to be like. So, we've got a lot of that going on right now. Laodicea just doesn't care. 
And we have a lot of churches now that are more concerned with how many hits they can get on YouTube, what their popularity is, how they can line their pocketbook, and which entertainer they can get into the church next. If they can make you laugh, make you dance, and make you sing, that's more important than getting you saved. In fact, they think when you do that, you got saved. Sad. Sad. How much things have changed in the last, really, three decades. I got saved just a little under three decades ago. Gosh, the church was really passionate back then. What has happened to us? What has happened? But God said it would. God said it would. You know, specifically in Matthew 24, 10 through 12, as we saw, we saw some of those, some of those things that really would, uh, uh, would continue to, to take place, um, that there would be decline in the hearts and the minds of men towards God and towards one another. And again, as I mentioned, just like the day that, um, just like the day that the flood approached, it would be the same way. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, I mean, you could just read right down that litany of, um, of items. There's just a whole slew of items. In the last days, uh, perilous times shall come. Men will be lovers of themselves, more than lovers of God, proud boasters, blasphemers. Uh, you just go right down that list. It just gets worse and worse the further you read. Folks, that's where we are. That's you could you could turn on any television show, primetime television show. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, back in the seventies. Yeah, there were a few shows that children shouldn't have watched, but for the large part, the worst thing you saw was was smoking and some alcohol, right? And the occasional, well, my parents didn't let me watch those kinds of shows anyway, but the occasional um, innuendo type show. Today. I mean, you've got it on daytime, you've got it on nighttime, you've got it in the afternoon, you've got it late night, you've got it in the morning. With cable, you got it 24-7, and it seems like nobody cares. Just everybody, everybody all the time. You've got children using language that I hadn't even heard of by the time they're three or four years old. It's, it's just insane. But that's where we are. That's where we are. 2 Timothy 2, 1-7. through 7. During the second, you know, at, at the second coming, I mentioned it, it'll, it'll be like it was in the, in the days of Noah. I would not be surprised if it was very similar during the time of the rapture as well, just like the days of Noah. Maybe not quite as bad, but certainly, certainly a, 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 a clear comparison. So folks, again, what is our duty as believers? Our duty is to stay the course. <clears throat> Our duty is to follow Christ. Our duty is to stay with Him. Our duty is to preach the gospel to everyone we can, to let them know that there is hope, to let them know that this is not the end-all, be-all, that it's not a particular leader, it's not a particular um, celebrity, it's not a particular voice out there that we're to be following. We're to be following Christ. We're to call upon God the Father, and anything that we ask God the Father in Christ's name, he will give it to us as long as we ask according to his will. And that's what the most important thing is. Because he wants us to be blessed so that we can serve him. Now again, as I implore you with every message, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there's not anything you can do. There's not anything you have to do. We're told in Scripture that our works, it's not by works of righteousness that we have done, but by His stripes we are healed. Okay, We can't do anything. If we could do something to save ourselves, Christ didn't need to die on that cross. And if we think we can do something to either be saved or to stay saved, then we spit on Christ hanging on that cross. And we trample underfoot 
the blood that he shed at Calvary. He did it all for us. All we need to do is believe in what he did, trust in him, turn from the things of the world and repent of those things and call upon him and ask him to guide our steps. And when we stumble and fall and drop back into some of those worldly things, just cry out to him. His word says that if we sin and we confess our sin, 1 John 1, 9, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that is a plural word in the Greek, meaning he cleanses us from all unrighteousness, says. Past and present, all done. And we're already forgiven for the future. We just need to get up and get washed off so we can get back and get close to him again. So friends, I know this has been an extremely long message. You may have had to <clears throat> take a break and listen to it in a couple of parts, but it's also very important because the Lord wants to know you and you need to know him. He made you to be known. He made you to be his. He made you for a specific purpose. He didn't make you to follow somebody else. He didn't make you to chase after somebody else, to trust in somebody else. He made you to love others as you love yourself. He made you to love him most of all. But he made you to be his. And when you are his, then you become the best neighbor, the best friend, the best father, mother, son, daughter, brother, sister that you can be. So until next time, stay in his word, stay true to his word. In Christ's undying love, amen.